Salutations, respected viewers. I'm George from Ireland. So here I am at 42 Holland Park, London. Not Holland Park Street, simply Holland Park. Um, and this was uh, the house where the head of the KGB in London was living in 1983, Arkady Guk. I believe he's no longer a going concern. Um, anyway, so there was a, a chap in the uh, um, in MI5, that's the UK's internal intelligence service, Michael Bettany, who decided that uh, there was a way to make some money. And that was by um, selling all the UK secrets to the Soviet Union. So um, <clears throat> Bettany, he was uh, born in, in Northern England, I think Yorkshire, grew up in a Catholic family and his faith was quite important to him. He was academically precocious. He went to Oxford where he read history. Supposedly he, he, he sang the horse vessel lead and uh, dressed like a bank manager, things like that. Uh, rather an odd fish. But uh, anyway, he's accepted into MI5, although he's probably psychologically unsuitable. He served in Northern Ireland in the 70s, uh, obviously the conflict being at its height there. And then he came to London and he was posted in the, the section which was monitoring uh, Soviet uh, diplomats because quite a few of them were undeclared intelligence officers. Um, anyway, so he got into trouble for a few things. He didn't realize his career was going nowhere and he was unsuccessful with women, but uh, he'd, be, he'd been arrested on a charge of being drunk and disorderly. There was something else he'd done, I can't remember. And then he was, um, he was found to be using an out-of-date um, season ticket. Um, so he thought that his career was going to be over. He was going to be sacked because every year they just made sure nobody had a criminal record. They need a sort of reliable, honest person who's honest with them to be working there, not somebody who's a liability. So um, he decided he would contact uh, Arkady Guk because he knew who Guk was. He, they, they, the United Kingdom had figured out that Guk was the head of the KGB station at the Soviet embassy. And we're not very far from where the Russian embassy is. Back then it was a Soviet embassy, of course, really about half a mile that away as the crow flies. So um, now the MI5 kept this place under surveillance almost 24 seven, but the, the United Kingdom had quite a limited team of people to do that. It was not like the Soviet Union where they put huge resources into it, so many people very openly um, keeping someone under surveillance. It would take at least four people to keep one person under surveillance. One in front, one behind, one to the left, one to the right, because they could change direction. They've got to be communicating. You don't want to lose them. You don't want to make it too blatant. So presumably some of the people in the house opposite were there with binoculars taking photos. Who's coming? Who's going? A car parks nearby. What's the registration? Um, to find out who's going in contact with them. But the United Kingdom didn't have enough human resources to keep these under, people under surveillance absolutely all the time. And who wants to work um, over Easter weekend? So after midnight on Easter Sunday, 1983, um, uh, Michael Bethany came here and he put a letter through that letterbox you can see across there. And he signed himself Cuba, K-U-B-A. Is it a reference to the country of Cuba or what? Or is it a bit like Coba, as in that was Stalin's nickname, uh, his nom de guerre in the 1890s. Anyway, and he uh, provided some intelligence that could only have come from uh, MI5 and offered to help and blah, blah, blah. And the Soviets were to signal their wish to, to cooperate. And it was some curious code by like leaving some chewing gum stuck to a certain um, lamp post on a particular street at a particular time and blah, blah, blah. Something that, that wouldn't be, nobody else would notice. And then he was going to signal his acceptance through some other curious and convoluted means. But anyway, the Soviets decided it was a hoax. It was um, a provocation attempt to entrap them. And then the, the British would catch them and say, ah, oh, it's into the appalling, you're spying here, you're persona non grata, you've got to leave the country. So, so they decided to just ignore it. But um, the, the, the deputy head of the KGB in London was Oleg Gordievsky. And Gordievsky, um, since he was a diplomat in Denmark several years earlier, I decided he detested communism and he wanted to help um, uh, the West. He's going to help these NATO countries because that will bring down communism in the Soviet Union and assure freedom and pro prosperity for the Soviet people. He wasn't particularly into breaking up the Soviet Union, but certainly ending uh, communist uh, one-party rule. Um, anyway, so he found out about this. He was quite alarmed. Would this guy find out who Gordievsky was? Of course, Gordievsky was the crown jewel of British intelligence and a closely guarded secret. Only a handful of people on MI5 were in on, on who Gordievsky was. So, um, and most MI5 people had no idea that there was a mole in the Soviet embassy helping them out. Um, and so then, what was the next thing? Um, so then, Bethany was ignored. He took umbrage at this, but he tried again on the 2nd of June. Anyway, so Gordievsky had t told um, MI5, his handlers, that there was somebody in MI5 who was trying to be a rat, who would turn his coat. So anyway, MI5 had to figure out who it was, who were the likely suspects. 
who was in trouble, who had financial difficulties, had personality problems, blah, blah, blah. They came to a short list of names. Finally, they thought it must be Bettany. Bettany had announced his wish to go on a holiday to Austria. Austria being neutral in the Cold War, not a NATO country. In 1955, when the Soviets and Western countries withdrew their troops from Austria, the deal was it had to be neutral. So from there, he could also very easily go to the Soviet bloc. So they called him up to their office and they um, questioned him and they said that we had all this information on him. They were bluffing slightly and he said he didn't do it, but then he then, then talked in hypotheticals. Well, if I did do it, this is how I would have done it and blah, blah, blah. He was clearly nervous. The point is they wanted to make it, get him to confess. The thing is he could have walked out of that building that moment, and which is what he should have done. And they realized they had no legal grounds to prevent him from leaving the country. Um, so, but uh, he foolishly didn't run whilst he had the chance and say, this is nonsense, I'm offended. Anyway, so um, they wore him down and they got him to confess and repeat it, you know, in the presence of the police and the solicitor, and that was that. And he was convicted for all sorts of uh, crimes, 10, 10 offences, espionage, got a 25-year sentence for breaking the Official Secrets Act. But he was released after 14 years in 1998. So, a far-left figure who had, had befriended him, this woman, thought he did it for idealistic reasons, which he, which he pretended, really, he just did it for hard cash. Um, anyway, so, and he lived out the rest of his life in relative long obscurity, becoming a sort of an, an idol to some of the far left. He died of natural causes last year. And Arkady Guk, he returned to the Soviet Union, I don't think it put a, put a damper on his career. But Gardievsky, well, he was exposed by Aldrich Ames, the American super spy, as in who was helping the Soviets the next year. So I won't tell you the whole Gordievsky story, but he was summoned back to Moscow because Guk was, was, was moving on to another post and supposedly Gordievsky was going to be promoted to replace Guk. But the, the, but, um, the KGB said to Gordievsky, come home, we need to tell you a few things and congratulate you. But anyway, there was an interrogation, not under torture, under pharmacological pressure. They'd given them supposedly this truth serum. But what a truth serum really does is to make you, make you susceptible to suggestion as in you'll agree with whatever's put to you. But anyway, he somehow managed to fight off and deny, 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 and got through it. I won't tell you the whole story, but there was an exfiltration plan. He had to signal to um, uh, MI6 officers at the British Secret Service who are in Moscow, to, that's British diplomats, that he wanted to flee the country. And he had to walk past a certain bread stall at a particular time on a Thursday evening. Um, uh, what is it, wearing a gray cap and eating a Kit Kat, this red thing or something like that, was holding a Safeway bag, Safeway supermarket was acknowledged by someone eating a Kit Kat with a red wrapper, blah, blah, blah. The long and the short of it is that he escaped in the boot of a car, a British diplomat's car via Finland, and he still lives in the United Kingdom to this day. So that is that. And so it's not, it's not, it's not a Russian um, a diplomatic building anymore. Although surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, right beside it is the Uzbek embassy. And I wonder whether the Soviet Union owned that one as well. And when the Soviet Union broke up, perhaps they shared out the buildings. I've noticed elsewhere the Belarus embassy and the, the um, uh, the Azerbaijan embassy are right beside each other. So I'm speculating here. Right, that's enough for the moment. Switching off.